Hello and welcome back to the Warwick F1 show. Obviously, as it is um, now the holidays, we're into the Easter holidays. We are online, not on the radio as normal, but we're still here, still ready to talk about Formula One. And we have another race to talk about the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix. I think probably a bit more disappointing than people were thinking. People thinking that it was going to be a classic, but not not having the best uh, race. Obviously, it's Sergio Perez taking that victory from Max Verstappen. Fernando Alonso in third. We'll be discussing the Red Bulls. Is there potential drama brewing for for the team? Um, Alonso start. Did he deserve the penalties that eventually dropped him out of the podium places before he was reinstated? And yep, Mercedes, McLaren and Ferrari as well. But obviously I'm here with Chime. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm all good. All good. I mean, yeah, I didn't get a chance to watch the race live. Um, but yeah, not as chaotic as the last two editions of the race. So I don't no. know if it's a good or a bad thing, but... At least, I think maybe if, maybe better that it wasn't as chaotic as twenty twenty one. Obviously, yeah, we've spoken no, about that a lot. You can't top that. <laughs> can't top that at all. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, you got some decent results. A bit of drama here and there as well. Um, now, we finally, get to start seeing the actual pecking order of the grid as well. Seems to be have a bit of a spicy upper midfield battle brewing as well, which is nice. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I'll run through the results now. Obviously, as we were saying, Sergio Perez taking his first win of the season with Ma- with Max Verstappen, recovering from 15th uh, in qualifying due to a broken drive shaft, recovering to second place. Then it was Fernando Alonso in third. He did drop out of the out of the podium positions with a penalty, um, but was reinstated into third place. George Russell and Lewis Hamilton in fourth and fifth and the Ferraris in sixth and seventh so Carlos Sainz and Charles Leclerc also taking a penalty then the two Alpines in Ocon and Gasly Kevin Magnussen scoring Haas's first points of the season overtaking uh, Yuki Tsunoda for 11th place in the final few laps uh, Nico Hulkenberg in 12th uh, Guan Yu Zhou in 13th Nick De Vries in 14th and then Piastri Sargent and Norris uh, 15th, 16th, and 17th, where, and then Valtteri Bottas' final finisher in 18th, um, suffering from damage from a incident right at the start, and then Alex Albon and Lance Stroll both retiring from the race. And Chime, we might as well start, obviously, with the top two, and again, another dominant display for, for the Red Bull team. Yeah, I mean, I, don't, I think we already, the championship's already decided. I think... At the moment, is who's going to come out on top and the drivers at the moment between the two Red Bulls at the moment? Because they do seem to be quite pretty much on par with each other from the looks of things, especially Perez being able to hold off Verstappen. Um, but yeah, I think definitely constructors-wise, constructors' championship is probably already sealed in. I think we knew that from the free season testing. To be honest, it's actually they haven't put they barely put a foot wrong and. They can afford to make so many mistakes, just how good the car is this year. But, yeah. I mean, do you think there is that battle? Because that has been the narrative that's come out of um, Jeddah. But for me, yeah. it, it's it's it smells a lot like last year, and that people thought Saudi Perez was were going to be a lot closer. He did very well in Saudi Arabia last year. Probably could have taken that win if not for an ill-timed safety car. Do you think? For me, it seems at least that it just is people trying to make something out of nothing. We know Perez is better on street circuits. We know he does better. He won at Monaco last year. He got pole at Saudi Arabia. He won in Singapore. And Max Verstappen hasn't diminished. Like He came no. from 15th to second. So it seems like people are just hope. For me, at least, it seems like people are hoping more than expecting an actual battle this season. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's it's a lot like well, Hamilton and Bottas, where it's like you see that Bottas doing winning the first couple of races, especially with 2019, where he won in Australia, I think, China or no, one think, of them. Yeah, it was like yeah, it was like Australia right at the start, and then he did and then, well for the next few. Yeah, before there was a big that big drop off. I think it'll be that. Like, I think it's going to be something similar to that, but I think an even sharper drop off, especially with how Red Bull developed their car for Max. And seeing that almost nobody else in the grid can drive that sort of car that Max has and that driving yeah. style. But I think definitely we'll see a definite 
probably 2019 star Mercedes dominance this season. I think we'll be something closer to that. We'll have something closer to that sort of season, I think, I believe. But at least with the upper midfield, which we'll probably go into in a sec. At least the upper midfield seems to be a bit spicy at the moment. Yeah. And I mean, maybe we're doing a bit of disservice to Sergio Perez. It was still a really, really good drive. He never really looks like he was under pressure, obviously overtaken by Alonso at the start, but then came back, overtook him, and then never really seemed under pressure, even as Max Verstappen started to close up after the safety car. Yeah, I think definitely, yeah, definitely. I mean, it could also it did hold him because Max did start to catch up as well, especially after overtaking Alonso with relative ease. And yeah, I mean, to be fair, like we said earlier, street circus is still Perez's speciality, especially, you know, he did got pulled and stuff last year and was very unlucky with that safety car. And then at least he kind of got that retribution today. But I mean, probably the best, the best performer of the three, my personal opinion, is still Fernando Alonso. Yeah, obviously, Fernando Alonso having that really good performance. I mean, he got into first on that one, I think. Uh, I was watching it, at least in the Clarendon, obviously, where F1 Society do all their watch-alongs. And the, the, cheer yeah. was, the cheer was so good. I mean, it was a really, really good start from him. And there was that hope, or at least I had that hope right at the start, that perhaps we could have a challenge to Red Bull. Obviously, it did end up not being the case. But it was, it was good to see him back at the front for the first time since uh first time leading lap one since Germany I think twenty twelve, so over eleven years ago now. Yeah. It it's insane. Like he, I think I mean to be fair, kudos to Aston Martin for that car development is actually genuine pace as well, because we've seen on two different completely different circuits almost. Like Bahrain and Saudi requiring two very different setups. And yeah, the fact that, you know, a lot Alonso seems to be the best of the rest so far outside the Red Bulls. It seems it's very impressive how he's managed to, you know, keep that pressure up as well. At least, I mean, he, I mean, he's nowhere near the Red Bulls, but at least he's can he can stay ahead of the Mercs and yeah. the Ferraris at the same same time as well. Yeah, well, staying ahead of the Mercs was something he maybe struggled with a bit because obviously Alonso was hit with not one, but two penalties. We'll start with the one that happened right at the start. We saw it straight away with that uh, starting line infringement, parking too far to the right in his box. Do you think that should be a penalty? Because for me, at least, it seems he's to the right. He's not in front of it. Then so there's not much advantage to be gained there. No, but I mean... Obviously, it depends on the track as well. I don't think it was much in this case, but you could have that tracks where if you are starting a bit further to the left, you can easily just keep that line much more easily. So I think the penalty was deserved because at the end of the end of the day, this is a, a thing that drivers practice almost all the time. It should be the back of their hand. So if they are slightly coming up that starting zone, I mean, I understand visibility is poor in the new re- in, with these new regs, but... um I think the penalty was a bit deserved because at the end of the day, you're breaking a rule. At the end, breaking a rule is not... I mean, in this case, not much of an advantage gain, I don't think. But I think definitely, especially on the other trucks, if you park into the side, you could actually be using it as an advantage, an unfair advantage. So I think at least just to keep that practice up, I think it, the penalty was deserved. Yeah, but... I, I sort of get the point. I mean, obviously... You do want to be in the box. I don't know what they were teaching the Alpine drivers last year, because now it's been Ocon and Alonso obviously drove for the team last year. But again, do you think that maybe they do need to work on that visibility, like you said? Like, it's now two and two. We've had Ocon in Bahrain, Alonso in Saudi Arabia. You look to some, some of the photos that were taken, there were drivers further back that were also out of their start box by quite a considerable margin. Do you think that maybe more needs to be yeah. done to help the drivers with that visibility? I mean, probably, yeah. There's always you can. There's always more you can do with the visibility and stuff. I mean, especially that's probably the main issue, one of the biggest issues that came with the, with the halo as well, because obviously you've got the halo sort of coming down right in the middle of the driver's vision. But I suppose there's not much really you can do, I don't think, at the moment. There is some, I think they believe they are trying to look at that for 2026 as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, we didn't have a lot, lot of issues last year as well with the new regs as well when the new regs were first introduced. So 
it's a bit of a hard one because obviously we we don't drive Formula One cars, so we don't know what it's actually like with visibility and stuff. Um, but yeah, definitely, if the drivers start complaining and the penalties keep racking, up, obviously it's something that the the F one will need, need to have and stuff like that. That yeah, but it's a, it's a bit of a weird one. Yeah, I mean, obviously, definitely would. Sorry, I think we're cutting out again. Yeah, I'm gonna put twelve twelve down up for that. Yeah, Sorry, I'll put twelve going. twelve. It seems to be fine now. Um, yeah, it's stabilizing. It's a lot better. Yeah, we can just we can just play around with when you're talking just uh, the best like yeah. time to sort of cut it in and out yeah but no uh sure. would we'll, do you want to jump on to the other alonso penalty yeah um, i'll introduce that one give me five four. seconds five okay. perhaps the weird one as well is that second 10 second penalty especially with the FIA decided to take what thirty laps or something to dish that that penalty, and then all of a sudden, next thing we know, we've, he's been reinstated on that podium because apparently, uh, Mister Crack has decided decided to show the FIA about seven different occasions where the same thing, the same sort of thing has happened. Where I think was it the mechanic touching the red, using the red jack, and then they don't get penalised in order to <laughs> appeal the penalty. It is a bit of a weird one that. Yeah, Isn't I mean, it? I think it was something. It was something I noticed when they when they did it that the mechanic puts the wheel or the jack under the car to get ready, and I always thought the rule was no no touching of the car by by anything, but apparently not. I mean, there are sort of two different issues here. I'd say there's more. There's the should the penalty have been given, and should it have taken as long or as long as it what did to be given because. Especially, maybe we'll start with the timing and how long it took. For me, it's like it's a very cut and dry issue. If you if you have a rule and you think the rule is no touching of the car at any point, it seems to be a really cut and dry issue that if you do see a team touching their car, then that is a penalty. That is a ten second time penalty, and uh, they should have to serve it serve it during the race or have that penalty during given during the race and then deciding where to go from there. Yeah, definitely. I um hundred percent agree. It's just it's just the fact that it took too long, way too long to decide the penalty because, you know, you you got immediate access to the cameras, you've got a massive team of st- uh, stewards and marshals and people who know how to penalize. Um because obviously being F one, you know, you, you will expect that most people, or the people who are stewarding as well, designing penalties are experienced in that role, they've done it multiple times and, you know f- f- even like 15 laps of Saudi Arabia is something what a good 20 minutes, half an hour at least and I'm pretty sure that they can decide a penalty within that at least within probably even 10 minutes 5-6 laps, I think and also with the rules I think it's just a classic cut and dry case, the FI are just not following their own rules we just yeah. we just don't know we just don't know what the what the real rules actually are. I think yeah. it's and just... it's, it seems that in so many cases there's so many rules now that are still ambiguous. Like the FIA don't even know what the rule is. I mean, they were they thought the rule was, or there was like an unwritten agreement not to touch the car from all the teams. But then, obviously, as you say, team principal of Aston Martin. Uh, Mike Crack then showed seven incidents where it wasn't penalised, and do you? And then it just throws it up in the air, and it's amazing how the FIA, like the the pinnacle of motorsport and F1 as well, there are still so many rules that are so ambiguous. And when you do have a sport as cutthroat and as brutal and as down to the last tenth as F1 is, you're going to have teams looking. That every every benefit, so you do have to have those airtight rules, and I don't think the FIA has them at the moment. Yeah, no, no they, do, they definitely haven't. It, I think we've discussed this so many times in the last tw- in the last two season, two three seasons since twenty twenty one, and it, it, it is like how long can we see this going on? Especially, I mean, 
I've seen it in other sports as well, you know, the, but there are those ambiguous rules, but F1 is just, it's like every single rule in F1 is just ambiguous. So what is the actual cut and dry rule? And mm. it's just that lack of sort of like clarity. It, again, it, there's nothing more to really say on my, it's just, they need to sort out. Yeah. I mean, would you, would you say it was a penalty? For me, I would say it it was a penalty because I do think touching the car is working on the car. When you put the jack under the car, you're beginning the work on the car. I don't think that it should have taken 30 laps until after the start, um, until after the end of the race, sorry. But for me, at least, it did seem that that is starting to work on the car and is does warrant a time penalty. And that's not... And I, pr- I can promise that that's not me maybe having my Mercedes bandwagon hat on. Obviously, George Russell would have got the podium with uh, with the penalty. But just if, if it was any team, I would have looked at I would have looked at that and thought, oh, they've started work on the car within the five second time limit. They haven't served it properly, and that is a penalty. Yeah, I mean, yeah. If you look at the rules that way, just definitely you definitely deserve a penalty because the fact that you know. They are you know, putting the jack on the car. You are preparing to lift the car, which is effectively working on the car. Um, but then you also look at it. You can also look at it from Aston's perspective with the fact that they've done it. With the, was it they show like seven different occasions where it happened, mm. and they haven't changed the rules. And they haven't really changed the rules in that time as well, and they haven't been penalised. So why should we penalise the eighth time that they do the same thing? But at the end of the day, it's just I mean, what is the actual rule? And they need to spare it to the teams. It's like this is the rule. If you're doing literally, if if you're going to put the jack on the car, it's going to be a penalty. If not, then it's not a penalty. But then we don't know if yeah. it is. That's the problem. But... Yeah, but it's such a it's such a weird one because I do think taking it into account from uh, last the last few occasions probably should make a difference. But it's just like why why have they noticed it? now and not noticed it then it's for me it seems it's because the car is at the front of the grids it's like when you when the FIA somehow doesn't have time to look at every incident so they focus on the Red Bulls the Mercedes the Ferraris and now the Aston Martins whereas if you're in the midfield if you're an Alpha Tauri or a Haas or a Alfa Romeo or whatever I think you seem to be able to get away with more because the FIA is just not really paying attention in a way. Yeah, definitely. I think, yeah, it's just, um, I, it's a bit of a weird one because obviously, I mean, yeah, you can know, definitely understand that, you know, every, there's obviously 20 cars on the track, there's loads of different things happening, not just with the cars, but outside as well. You're looking at the different teams, you're having more onto radio, you make sure they're not breaking radio protocols as well. And, but yeah, it, it's just, it's a bit of a weird one because as much as we understand it is a very difficult operation to do, being a, a race steward and directing or make sure everybody's following the rules, it needs to be some sort of clarity of like if rules are being broken, how they're being broken and what are the real penalties. Because, I mean, we saw, I mean, probably the biggest numbers with the cost cap. But we did not know what the punishments were going to be. We didn't know how bad the breaches were, or if it was whether Red Bull's breach was really as big as it says. We really don't know. It's it's just a very very ambiguous continuous matter. Of this, but yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a very very weird one. I'm sure we won't stop talking about the FIA for no uh, a while yet. And we'll come on to races. It's always Austria. That's when we always talk about the FIA because of the track limits and how strict they <laughs> yeah. are around there. Turn four track off. limits. Yeah, when we get to Austria, that's going to be part of my prediction. It's like 20 cumulative seconds of time penalties or something from track limits. It's, it's a bit <laughs> of a weird one. Yeah. But another team that did struggle, or maybe a team that struggled, was Ferrari. And they just did not have a good race. I think they didn't benefit from the safety car that did come no. out. Uh, Leclerc, I think, had he got ahead of Hamilton and then came out behind him because yeah. of the safety car. But it was quite a turnaround from, uh, from like, 
Bahrain even when Leclerc was basically cruising into into third place and then obviously his car broke down. Carlos Sainz yeah. maybe having a tougher race and what what went wrong? It just seems like Ferrari have really fallen off. It's Ferrari. I think <laughs> for me the only explanation is that it's it's Ferrari. Because I mean I'm I've I'm building that I think I've said this in the last review as well. I'm building a list of just compilations of all the Ferrari messing up. And I've already I mean to be fair, not as big as Bahrain, but you got that whole incident where was it Leclerc was told by Rady Engineer to push to Hamilton, even though Hamilton already overtaken and then Leclerc mm-hmm. was told of his engineer just you need to be quicker. And then and then I think is it both Ferraris have got the second uh, internal combustion engines in already out of three yeah. and there's the third race well, of the season. Well, I mean, Something yeah, obviously else. Leclerc Leclerc took that took that penalty for um this race for taking another was it the control unit or uh, not the engine? Yeah, it was the control I'm electronics. Yeah. yeah, I think is it is the electron is the control electronics that uh he had to uh, do his he had to do temper his grid penalty for and which is and they already he's already third out of second third out of two available um but it's i i can't i can't i'm trying to, i'm trying to explain how far are you messing things up he like mm. even for sir saying about doing all these diner testing over winter i'm like have you really been doing it because how are you messing up this bad yeah, I mean, and it maybe raises a question about that reliability because Ferrari have had their issues. We've seen with Leclerc already taking a penalty. Uh, Aston Martin, Lance Stroll retiring that did bring out the safety car. Red Bull even had issues uh, with Max Verstappen in qualifying. And uh, from what they've said is that they are having to run the car slower then it can run. Obviously, slower is still half a year quicker than everyone else. But yeah. they are having are having to run the car slower than it can because of that reliability concern for both Red Bull cars. It's it's an interesting one because yeah, reliability could again play a role in deciding some races, just as it did last season. And the the way the rules are these days in how few engine components that you get is going to point to later on in the season, like we saw last season, grid penalties in maybe Belgium and Italy when at those points when you're coming towards the end of the season. Yeah, definitely. It's, yeah, it's a bit weird as well, because especially we've got the engine freeze. We have the engine freeze for another three seasons now, including this one. Mm. And, you know, the engines have not changed as such since... 2014 really there's not really been any major changes to the engines as such but the only one is the biofuel is the e10 fuels that were introduced uh last year uh, or the year before um but yeah i mean because you obviously we look and the fact is it's almost all the engines because we look we've seen ferrari been ferrari engines obviously been the bigger ones uh, Lance retiring, and then uh, we go back to Barbary where Norris had the hydraulics leak throughout the entire race, and had to pit like 700 times, and then Verstappen with the drivetrain issues as well. So, yeah, it's definitely going to play a big role. I mean, I think, yeah, we should all expect the massive confusion with the uh, grid penalties in <laughs> Belgium, Italy, you name it. I think, yeah, I think we'll definitely be expecting them to come at some point. Um but yeah, I think at the end of the day, reliability is such a big factor because if, if you want to win, you need to finish. Yeah, I mean we're gonna be, we're gonna be pulling out we're gonna be pulling out spreadsheets to work out who and who it starts where, and obviously we did have that uh, retirement. For for Lance Stroll, but it's quite disappointing because he was running. He was running in a good position. He'd made that overtake on Sainz, which at least for me is the best overtake of the season so far. Like he he was doing well. I do think that Stroll is having a quietly confident start to the season. Obviously, he's not at the level of Fernando Alonso, but I don't think that that's to his downfall. When when we see Fernando Alonso still performing at such a high level. He's competing with the Mercedes. He's competing 
with uh, science as well. And I mean, do you think he's starting to prove prove the naysayers wrong a bit? Yeah, and I think with signs as well. I mean, probably he can probably use this Ferrari knockoff to his advantage as well, especially there'll be a lot less pressure. The only pressure we have is car signs and stuff. So um, uh, for car signs will be Charles Leclerc. And yeah, it's definitely going to be, hopefully, a good start. He hasn't hit, he hasn't hit any gravel traps just yet. I mean, to be fair, there's not really been any gravel traps from him <laughs> just yet. We'll see in Australia, but uh, yeah, I think yeah, he's had a he's had a fairly quietly comfortable com- comfortable start to the season. Definitely, um, all he needs to do is just help Leclerc push up to the Mercs and the and Fernando Alonso and Lance Stroll. Hopefully, once his hands gets fixed as well, so. Yeah, definitely have a look, see how the season goes. Because at the end, it's only the second race of the season. We still need to get yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. We're two races in. Obviously, no one's got any hope for the championship anymore. So we may as well have have some fun races. So, I mean, the other top team that we haven't spoken about is Mercedes. And for me, it felt weird that I thought Mercedes did better this race but the language coming out of the team was far, far more critical of their performance than, yeah. than it was in Bahrain. And that was odd. Yeah. I think it's more to do with the fact that I think Mercedes aren't just happy with the fact that they can't fight the front at the moment, that they're, they're pretty much just, they pretty much messed up with the the whole design philosophy. Because I think was it in the last couple of weeks, they've actually... Uh, restructuring the actual aero department and I think they fired a couple of people as well um or something like that um but yeah because I think especially with Mercedes they're not very happy with the way they're able to develop this the sideless so like side podless design that they've got mm. and the fact that you know they're very comfortably behind Red Bull where that's not where they want to be I feel the optimism that had to come into this year has just been completely smashed and I think that's what it is at the moment. Yeah. And another story that did come out, obviously, uh, was surrounding Lewis Hamilton. They were saying that uh, he was right. He didn't think that they should be following the same t- design philosophy as last year with the W13. They did. And the W14 has started linking or people linking him with uh, Red Bull and uh, a move there, which, again, seemed, seemed to me... A really odd story. He's never going to go to Red Bull. They've got Perez, no. they've got Ricardo, they've got Lawson, they've got so many people. And if you want a teammate battle that's going to be any worse than Senna versus Prost, just stick Hamilton and Verstappen <laughs> in the same car, and yeah. you will you will have absolute carnage. But again, it's sort of coming out how, or it seems to be coming out that maybe Hamilton isn't performing at the level that he wants to but again he was quite dominant over George Russell in Bahrain he only finished five or so seconds behind um, him in Saudi Arabia on what was probably a slightly compromised strategy maybe the safety car coming too early for him for those hard tyres that he did start on do you think that it has been as bad a start to Lewis's season as maybe maybe he's saying maybe uh, a few people are saying but or do you think it's just generally Mercedes are having a a shocking like sort of time of it and Hamilton's getting caught up in that as well as as well as George Russell as well yeah I think for me I think it's just Mercedes shock that they can't that the targets were not what they thought they would be because I think I think what it is is this like I don't think Lewis is just not connecting with the car as the way he would back in, you know, 2019, 2020. You know, it's obviously, I I think the new regs just completely caught out Mercedes, which probably is probably what the FIA wanted, which <laughs> would they do with any new technical regulations. They always want to, you know, outdo, they want to outsmart and pretty much put stick the uh, front runners on the rod. They did that with Red Bull 2014. They've done it with Mercedes now. Um, so, you know, they're, I think it's just more the fact that they're not 
they're just not they want they're just desperate to get back to the front as quickly as possible, which I think which is fair enough. I don't I don't blame them, especially what winning eight constructors championships in a row and now all of a sudden you're struggling to hold on to even third place in the championship now. Mm. Um if the season is gonna stick with the current packing order. So yeah. It's definitely gonna be uh, interesting to see how Mercedes and how Lewis Hamilton goes on. I don't think so he's gonna I mean I don't think he's going to move team. There's very unlikely the chance unless Lawrence Stroll comes in, offers him a low, like 300, so like a, a Ronaldo Anasa star contract and boots out Alonso. But, but yeah. yeah, I think. I, I don't think that's going to happen. I think, yeah. Al- honestly, Alonso will be driving till he's 50. I don't see that man. Like, it's weird because he is, what, 41 now? But you don't see him retiring yeah. anytime soon. And especially yeah. if. Aston Martin, as we were saying um, in the Bahrain uh, episode we did, if Aston Martin can leap from being ninth, the the ninth quickest team at the start of 2022 to the third quickest team at the start of 2023, what can they do at the start of 2024? We could be seeing Fernando Alonso right right at the top. And uh, hopefully for all Mercedes fans, it could end up being a Hamilton, Hamilton, Verstappen, Alonso like trifecta at the top if Mercedes also get their get their car working. Yeah. I think uh I think it's just I think yeah, I I definitely can see Mercedes obviously being the best team at developing the car. I mean, their track record is fantastic, especially late season development. Um obviously I hope that Aston Martin can as well. They're aware of the unknown factor because of the fact they've only just moved into the new factory. <laughs> Um, but I mean, we did see last season as well that their mid-season development was very strong because they were quite comfortably in the top of the, towards the top of the midfield, consistent point finisher, at least in the last three, four races of the season, fighting, um, Alonso to line Suzuka with Vettel, which is fan- one of the best finishes I've seen in the last few yeah. years. And... I mean, we didn't get to, we didn't get to see it because no. the TV direction was appalling. I was like, actually, quick shout out to the Saudi Arabia TV direction. It yeah. is phenomenally, it's so good. Like, yeah. it's, I know it's probably the track lends itself to just switching from one camera to another, but it is incredible yeah. how they do it. And yeah, they're just fantastic camera, the camera angles as well are fantastic. I think one of the best setups we do have. Among the different yeah. tracks as well, which is nice. I mean, yeah, it's even definitely even if the race isn't good, it just looks yeah. pretty. <laughs> yeah, probably yeah. One of the best, definitely, possibly at the moment, the best spectacle. One of one of the, like, the best spectacle we have in Formula One at the moment because yeah. obviously we do have a certain race in Las Vegas down the strip oh, in November. It's gonna be so stupid and it's gonna be so good yeah. at the same time. So American, but I mean. <laughs> We only got, but no. we got Miami in a few weeks, so... Yeah, so driver of the day can go to uh, the driver of the helicopter that gave us all those fantastic yeah. helishots. Yeah, definitely. I think... Def- but, yeah. Yes. I think probably we can quickly uh, shout out to Magnussen as well, getting his first yeah. point of the season as well. Has getting the first point on the se- of the thing Was as well. 10th and 12th, yeah. and I think... They seem to be very mature, and we saw some comments after that they're saying the quickest driver will go through. They're not going to hold each other up, and I think that's yeah. incredible. That's very mature from two drivers that maybe haven't had the greatest relationship in the past are coming to the end of their careers and perhaps recognize that their jobs now. Obviously, they're not going to be there for that much longer. I mean, no. they're coming, they're quite old, and they are coming to uh, the twilight stages. Their job is to just score points and yeah. have to keep to keep them ticking over. Yeah, I think it's more of a. I think definitely we'll probably see them becoming more of a mean team. Hopefully later in the season as well. I think they're just there for the sake of racing and racing in F one. They haven't got anything much to lose now. So, you know, especially Nico Hulkenberg because I think Hulkenberg's what thirty five now, thirty six. So like that, definitely yeah. late thirties. One of the oldest drivers. Obviously, Kevin Magnussen is also in his early thirties as well. Um, but yeah, definitely a solid performance. I think the car seems to be quite decent as well. I mean, hopefully it has to start to actually put upgrades in the car this year. But yeah, 
Yeah. But one team that obviously didn't have that great of a performance uh, was McLaren. And while it was quite funny last season to, or last race to sort of joke around with how bad the car is, this, this race I felt quite bad for them because Piastri, first of all, Piastri has had an incredible start to his F1 career. I think, I think proving, yeah. everyone, proving everyone right in that he is, he's now, what, has he out qualified Lando Norris twice or is it one all? In the back. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what the qualifying results. I'll quickly have a look. Oh no, no. I I think Norris beat him in Bahrain because yeah. oh yeah, Piastri got out. Oh no, it was Logan Sargent. Yeah, Piastri got out Q one. Norris got through on setting the lap first ahead yeah. of Logan Sargent in Bahrain. Yeah. So yeah, it's one all. But like ninth, ninth compared to your teammate in seventeenth is always going to be a good performance. And when oh, it yeah. is against Lando Norris. And yeah. you're a rookie driver. That's that's a great start to your career. And not to mention, both cars were probably about equally damaged, and Piastri overtook Norris of 49 lap older hearts, or something like oh that. Gosh, like wait, did did no, Piastri like, not pit? Past, because Piastri obviously pitted on the first lap uh, because obviously the, fr- the collision with Bottas, and then he did not pit for the rest of the race. Oh He's still on the God, same set hearts. Yeah, very Albon esque. Yeah. It's that just was very incredible. Him. But, yeah. yeah. And they have struggled. But I do think that ninth gives them a bit of hope. Yeah. That Piastri did, was ninth. He managed to... He would have... He seemed to have the pace. He just got really unlucky at the start. And then he got mm. doubly unlucky that his end plate then bounced and hit Lando Norris. Like, yeah. It was a good... It, I think it was a promising race for McLaren yeah. rather than a good race. Yeah. I think when McLaren... I don't think they're as bad as it looks at the moment. I think, first of all, the first race was definitely unreliability for sure, because mm. obviously Piastri had the blue screen of death on the steering wheel, and then uh, uh, Norris had that hydraulics leak. Um, but then obviously this race, both were hit by damage, and I think, from the looks of things, I don't think the McLaren, McLaren the MCS60 can definitely fight in the midfield, probably even... I, would, I could probably say Optimus, they can definitely be a regular point scorer, especially around like the Alpine level, because they're still fitting their upgrades on the car to the spec they wanted it to be. And, you know, both drivers, I think, yeah, both drivers seem to be very solid as well. And hopefully, you know, with James Key leaving the team as well, which is probably a big news that's come out recently as well, that, you know, McLaren have restructured their technical thing with James Key and leaving the team effectively just making it, splitting it three ways that reports directly to Andrea Stella. Um, I think this definitely seems to be a good step, step in a good direction. Very, very a logical step for the team. So hopefully, you know, especially with a new, they've got, I think they've got a new wind tunnel coming out later this year as well, they're going to start using as well. So it things seem to be on, still seem to be on the up for McLaren. I don't think you can rule them out of an absolute disaster of a season just yet. Yeah, seems to be lots of restructuring going on. Obviously, we've had McLaren, Ferrari as well. Lots of reports coming out that their whole uh, system's getting restructured. Um, Mercedes as well, as we've spoken about. Lots of, lots of restructuring going on. But Piastri, do you, we'll maybe talk quickly about Piastri. He just has that had a really good start to the season and I think has very much demonstrated that he deserves to be in F1, yeah. F1 so far. Yeah. I think the only thing with Piastri is just the controversy of how he's got into the sport with the whole drama last year. And I feel, I think the one thing that would be interesting with Piastri is see how, obviously, he compares with Norris head-to-head when both both McLarens are actually, you know, running, they're finishing the race there with the pace. And then also how the fan reaction is going to be next weekend. Because obviously we um, are going to oh, Australia. Yeah. It's Australia. It's Oscar's home race, and especially with the another with the other Aussie that um, Oscar ended up unfortunately kicking out with Danny Ricardo. Um, we are going to see. Thank well, we are going to see Danny Rick on the grid. Um, that, that is obviously confirmed uh, with, for Red Bull and stuff like that. So mm. yeah, we'll definitely see how the, <laughs> how the home fans react to that. But I think yeah. Piastri, I, I never had any proof really doubt. I mean, you just look at his junior career. He's got a stellar junior career. I don't think people, I don't know why people are really doubting him, to be fair. Yeah. I mean, another 
rookie that has come in and for me at least has outperformed I think expectations as well it is Logan Sargent had a very good race in uh, Bahrain had quite a like a solid race here and I think like that's that's what he should be doing in the Williams he should just be putting in solid performances and I think he he seems to be doing that yeah definitely I think you know he was close to the points in Bahrain he's definitely fighting up there with the back I mean especially the Williams seems to have closed the gap um, to the field, which is nice, they can actually, possibly, uh, at least with the offers, the houses, and, and well, and that, it would, it's definitely nice to see Sergeant performing, you know, definitely a solid, solid uh, start to the season for him as well. Yeah, and are we, are... Are there any other stories that we're missing? I feel like we've done. I feel like we've done everything. I think that what it was, yeah. it was a decent race. Obviously, nothing, nothing too special. Like what, what, what yeah. would you give? We always do the what would you give it out of ten? I think for me, it's going to be probably a five. I don't think, yeah, much entertaining. Uh, much entertaining things happen. Obviously, it then. It's we've never escaped the FIA in Saudi Arabia always always having those issues. Obviously, we had twenty twenty one the decision to race last year, and now all these penalties. The FIA are never going to have a easy easy ride in um in Saudi Arabia. But for me, fairly fairly standard race. I think it's had a lot in the final five laps. We were watching sixteenth, seventeenth, and eighteenth have a battle as opposed to yeah. anyone else. So for me, five out of ten. I'll probably give yeah, I'll probably give it five, maybe five and a half. I think uh yeah. Definitely not the most entertaining, probably by far the most boring Saudi mm. we've had so far Saudi race we've had so far, but yeah, I think especially with uh, I'm seeing the season go, I don't think we're gonna be expecting a lot of mangas. It's gonna be a lot more mellow season, so I think definitely more along the sort of, you know, twenty nineteen ish I'm getting very 20... 2019-ish sore vibes from this from the season, so yeah. I think 2015 as well. It'll, it'll be very similar to those ones. Yeah. Not really a title battle, but and one team sort of sort of dominating. But we we can hope, and that's hopefully hopefully the cost cap penalties might might drag Red Bull back yeah. into it, and Definitely. maybe maybe it'll drag them back into it for the next race, which is Australia. <laughs> And uh, I fully respect the Australian Grand Prix for not caring about the amount of DRS zones and deciding to chuck in four just for the fun of it. Yeah. Do you think that? Oh, they bring... Do you think that will stay this year? I don't know. Hopefully, um, especially because I think one of the reasons was the, I think one reason why they took it out was the porpoising last year, and obviously because porpoising's um... mostly been eradicated. Okay. Obviously, I think except for that one scare that we had with we saw with the W14 preseason. Yeah. Uh, I don't think so. I don't. I think we could see a chance if they bring about the DRS zone as a helpfully will help you overtake it on the back straight as well. Because um, obviously Australia is not the easiest circuit to overtake on. Generally, we'll see a lot of trains. Um, but yeah, definitely nice to finally get out, have a finally have a proper day race. No, yeah. it'll be the first day race of the season. Um, it won't be a day race for us because it'll be a oh, not for us. No, six o'clock I, in the morning. I'm not waking up for that. <laughs> but... I think I, I think I'll wake up for it because I think I'll just watch it in bed. Yeah, I think the only the, I didn't wake up for Japan because as soon as they went to a red flag, I was like, this could be half an hour. This could be two hours, and yeah. I don't want to wait, so I'm going to go back to sleep. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I think after that one whole night I spent was it 2019 Japan where I stayed the entire night to watch because oh I think because they did like qualifying to Sunday morning so it was like 1:30 morning UK time and then the race was like was six or something so I was like I'll just stay up, I'll just stay up for the whole night and I ended up yeah. staying staying up and yeah <laughs> but yeah. And so, we need yeah. to, we need to do obviously predictions and all we need to look at. Our predictions from last week. I think we both what we both got them up here. I'll just scroll through my phone, try and find them. Yeah, yeah, I've got them, I've got them here. So podiums. What did what did you go for for the podium? For the this is the first the first one to take the first win 
yeah. of the season. <laughs> so yeah, we all came in the same point system as last season. So mm-hmm. obviously, with the podiums, obviously one point for one point if the person's on the podium but the wrong position. Three points for the exact for an exact match. Uh, I went Verstappen, Leclerc, Alonso. So that will give me a solid four points because obviously Alonso mm-hmm. came third. Uh, but Verstappen came second rather than won the race, so... Yeah, so. I went Verstappen, Perez, Alonso. It's, uh, it's going to start a trend of being very close to being very good and then yeah. not getting it. So oh, yeah. I got five points, if I'm not mistaken, because yeah. Alonso in third, and then uh, Verstappen and Perez switched themselves around. Yeah. And then what was your uh, one-pointer? So my one pointer, and I cannot believe that this did not happen. Sorry, I just had to go go check the results there. I cannot believe this did not happen. But a red flag in the weekend. There were no red flags. There were no red flags. What is Saudi Saudi Arabia Arabia doing? That that is insane. (laughs) I feel like, yeah. I mean, my one was Sergeant beats Albon in the race. I mean, he technically did. I mean, he did beat Albon because Albon retired. So yeah. Yeah, I'll give you. I'll give you that. Mine, um, uh, what was your, or my two point was two by two in quali. Uh, yeah. That didn't happen because um, uh, Verstappen didn't get through. And then Lance Stroll yeah. was setting the lap of the gods and then messed up at the final corner again. Yeah. Like, almost there. And the, if I'd said in the race, it would have been really close as well. Because what was it? Apart from Alonso, I think it was two by two for the entire top nine so you had yeah. the red bulls then the mercedes and the ferraris and the alpines and i think at one point the hasses were or the hasses were close as well yuki sonoda just outside just ruining that so almost i almost yeah. would have got it in the race but definitely didn't get it during quality what about you yeah uh my quality my one was like there was a mercedes out in q2 uh that didn't happen no uh um because obviously, I think we we'll cons- I think Tom and Bahrain that were fairly concerned about Mercedes straight line speed. I thought, you know, <laughs> they could possibly be actually be that slow and get out in Q two. But nope, they was it, was it close? Uh, uh, I, I can't don't remember what the Q two so. results were. Yeah, um, hang on, look, I don't think so. They were fairly comfortable in getting into Q wow. three, both of them. Um, but then three pointers. Uh, <laughs> You're not right. I need to have a quick rant. My three-pointer was so close to being right, and it should have been right if the FIA, for some inexplicable reason, decided to put a safety car out for a car that was basically 90% behind the barrier and in a position where no other car on the planet could have crashed into it. That was a VSC all day of the week, and it's cost me three points, and I'm not, ah. I'm not happy about it. Ah. Oh, uh, okay. But, okay, so... My three pointer, um, I actually had said that the top ten had to consist at least two of the four of all four engine manufacturers. So there'd be two Red Bull powertrains engines or Honda engines, whatever you prefer to call it, two Mercs, two Ferraris, and both Alpines had to be in the top ten, and yeah, all in the top nine. Uh, that is, it's an incredible prediction, and yeah. I will give you full credit because it's the it, I, it was the Alpines I was doubting because it re- relied on them both being in the top yeah. ten, and they somehow somehow managed it. Yeah, fair. So yeah, I believe that will make eight six to me to begin the season. Uh, eight, well, you got your one pointer, didn't you? Yeah, so my one point oh, yeah, is I've yeah. got four points in prediction, four points in podium, three points uh, for my three point and one pointer. So it's eight six, I believe, isn't it? Did Cause... I get my one pointer? What was your one pointer? It was no a red flag at some point. In the oh, okay, so it's eight five. I think it's eight five. Yeah. Well, yeah. what a brilliant start! I was so <laughs> close to so many more points, and ah, I feel like no. that's hopefully hopefully that's not the story of the yeah. season, but. What are we going for in Australia? Oh, so probably Australia. I think I'm going to give this one an easy Verstappen victory, hopefully. Hope, probably. What I'll probably go a Perez second. So probably another Red Bull one, too. Actually, because we are talking about uh, another street circuit as well. So Perez should be strong on that track as well. 
Mm. Um, probably third place. Actually, I'm going to change it slightly. I'm going to go for Stappen Alonso Perez. Ooh. Ooh, that's 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 a bold one. I think it could happen, but I I just can't see if the Red Bulls both finish at the moment. I just can't yeah. see one of them or them not being one two. Yeah. So something quite crazy would have to happen. I'll also go for a Verstappen win. I think that no, just has to has to be yeah. predicted. But then <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go Verstappen Perez Leclerc. I think Leclerc will get his first podium. Yeah. of the season he was he was that. really good he was really good around australia he got that grand slam last year and i think um i think he'll do or he'll at least get a podium this season as well so that's our podium so you've gone uh verstappen alonso perez i've gone Ver- verstappen perez leclerc what do you think for one point predictions my one pointer it might be a bit stronger i think both mclarens get out q1 Finally, yeah, yeah, I'll I'll give you yeah. That feels like a one point. I feel like they should have both got out of Q one so far, and they they sort of haven't. Uh, my one pointer. Oh, I have not thought of this. I'm going to make it up on on the fly. Um, yeah, Mercedes or no, Aston Martin outscore Mercedes. Okay. I can. That's definitely a good one as well. Um, yeah, I'm also. Yeah, I'm also making mine on the spot as well. <laughs> so my two, my Q two, um, many from last year. I'm going to go for Alonso pole position. Oh, see, I think that that's possible because like the gap isn't. I don't think the gap is as far from yeah. quality to the uh, to the race like as far as Red Bull. Out in front, I I'll give that a two point. I think I'd maybe even nudge it to a three. But you've said you've said two now. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it as a two pointer. I, I don't think it's the three pointer because I think there is a chance that he can because yeah. the Aston Martin is probably second fastest at the moment. Yeah, I am going to say for my two pointer, Piastri scores his first points. Okay. In F1. Oh, we're gonna go on the Australian theme. I think it. I think fairly, fairly solid two points. So we've like McLaren, not being close to a points finish just yet. So let's yeah. let's hope hope for their sake they manage it, and hope for my sake that it is uh, the Australian driver. Yeah, and three pointer. Ooh, a three pointer. This is going to be a fairly difficult one. I think I definitely do a race one because I've done two two quality predictions. I think with the race, I'm going to go for five DNFs. Five, five, five plus or five specific or five. Exactly. It has to be five, five, exactly five. Right. It has to be exactly um, five. Um, I think five plus might be, I think I want to make a proper three pointer. So I think exactly hmm. five DNFs. This is when I quickly Google the weather in Melbourne and see if it gives me any indication of what, what will happen over the next yeah. uh, week. No, and no by the way, when I say five DNFs, it has to be classified DNF as well. It can't just be, you know, yeah. end your failure at the last lap of the race and then obviously gets a sort of a You're, why classified you, as a why, finisher. Why are you arguing specifics? This is a sort of ambiguity that we can chuck in and then argue about during, during the Yeah, we're going to forget this. We're, we're probably yeah. going to forget what I've said anyway, so... <laughs> and I've said, uh, I've said a one... Well, my one point... Uh, for Saudi Arabia was a red flag during the weekend. I'll go a red flag during the race. Okay. For my three points, I think the four DRS zones, especially the two or the one that goes into the fast left right, and then the one out of it, that could yeah. cause I think a bit of chaos and perhaps perhaps lead to a red flag. And I think I think that's a fair, fairly, um, fairly appropriate three pointer. And more. I, we need to we need to come up with uh, a rule. What happens if one of us get everything perfect? Do you get bonus points or something? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, if we, I'm just trying to think. If all of us get, if we get everything right, I think the maximum in our system, I think, is that fif- it's 15, fifteen points. Yeah. Probably... I think you should get five bonus points. Yeah, so, before you get twenty points, before you get, you get a if you get a perfect point. prediction. But... <laughs> 
Yeah. Oh, there you go. I'll take that. But yeah. yeah. So 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 I'll we'll just run through it again. So my podium, Verstappen, Perez, Leclerc. One point is Aston Martin outscore Mercedes. Piastri scores his first points for two points, and then a red flag during the race for a three-pointer. Yeah. Uh, my one is I'm going for a Verstappen Alonso Perez podium. So a bit spicy one. My one-pointer is the McLaren get both the cars outside the key one. My second one, two-pointer, is a pole position by Alonso. And there'll be exactly five DNFs in the race. Yeah. This so, is as my obviously... sort of big one. Yeah. And obviously we'll have to wait and see. But yeah, thank you for watching. Oh my God, they're watching us. They can see our beautiful faces this time. That's terrifying. So yep. thank you. Thank, thank you for watching. Yep. Um, we'll be back next week talking about the Australian Grand Prix that is coming up um, in the next few days. Uh, we'll be back, obviously, into term three, talking about all the races and everything else that's coming along. Thank you to Chime as always, for co-hosting. You looking forward to Australia? Obviously, you. you will be asleep, so you won't be watching it. Yeah. Uh, hopefully. Uh, hopefully it's a good race. I want a good one. Mm. No. It's always one that looks yeah, nice. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. a nice race. Great atmosphere, great fans. Mm. You know, Daniel Ricciardo is going to be there, so it'll be nice for a bit of paddock stuff. And, you know, definitely. Let's see. Yeah. Let's see what happens. Yeah, and hopefully it should be a good one. So, as I was saying, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And yeah, have a great day.